Hi, everybody. God bless you. We, also, hi to the campuses. We're so uh, glad that God is blessing there, adding, changing people's lives. And we, I thank you tonight for the privilege of being able to share God's Word with you and with the campuses. And may the Word of God encourage you, strengthen you, challenge you, change you, and enrich you. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but the word of the Lord will endure forever. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Tonight I'm going to speak about why we were created. If somebody had to ask you that question tonight, how will you answer it? I believe that not everyone is able to answer that question, and, and it is quite amazing because if we do not know why we've been created, how can we possibly be doing what God has created us to do? If you do not know why God has created you, then it is impossible to do what He's created you to do. In Isaiah 43, verse 7, He says, Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him. Yea, I have made him. God tells us very clearly in that passage of Scripture that He has created us for His glory. Now, what is the meaning of glory? We sing about glory. We pray about glory. We preach about glory. But what is the glory of God? I believe the glory of God is every aspect of who God is and every part of what God does. Every aspect of who He is and every part of what God does. If you go back to the Old Testament, you will find Moses on Mount Sinai. There's lightning. There's, there, there's all kinds of things going on. And he says to the Lord, show me your glory. Show me your glory. And the Lord allows His goodness to pass by. And He shows Moses His goodness. And He says, I will have mercy upon those that I will have mercy, and I will have kindness upon those that I will be kind to. So when Moses asked God, show me, give me a manifestation, a revelation of your glory, what does He do? He shows one of His characteristics. His goodness. And, we, and he talks also about his mercy and the fact that he's a compassionate God. Now, if you go to the New Testament, you'll find in John that Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And uh, he begins to perform miracles. Jesus performed no miracle until he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. He leaves the River Jordan. He goes into the desert to be tempted. And later on it says he went to a marriage feast in Cana. They ran out of wine, and so he turned six jars of water into wine. But this is what the Scripture says. It says, this beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. On Mount Sinai, Moses cries, God, show me your glory. And he shows a characteristic, his goodness and his mercy and kindness. But here through Jesus, he shows his power. Because Jesus turns the water into one. So the, it is as, every aspect of who God is and every part of what God does. God's plan from the very beginning of time was to reveal His glory through His creation. His glory, which is His character, uh, and also His power. And so He takes the dust of the earth, He forms man, and He breathes him to the breath of life, and man becomes a living soul. Adam and Eve had the privilege of having God's glory manifested through them, because He had created them for His glory. Adam named all the animals. Adam and Eve were brilliant. 
They were never to get sick. There was no sickness. They would never die. They would live forever and ever. And so there, there, there's the characteristics and there's the power of God manifested through Adam and Eve. They were created for His glory. But it says later on that Satan comes and deceives them. And something terrible happens because at that moment when they listen to the devil, the glory departed from them. And God drove them out of the Garden of Eden and He put an angel at the gate so that they could not get back to the tree of life. The glory of the Lord that His plan and purpose was to be revealed through man now was moved from them because of sin. Now, if you go to Romans 3.23, it says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then he says it in the New Testament. You see, we, we say sin is when people do bad things. That's the fruit of sin. He's saying the reason why we are sinners is because we fall short of the glory of God. Now, I know we always say that we've been created in the image and the likeness of God, but that's not really the teaching of Scripture. Because if you go later in Genesis, it said Adam had a son, and the son was born in the image and the likeness of his father. Not God, his father. Why? Because man had fallen into sin. The glory had departed. But God's plan continues to go forward. And God still, want, still plans to have His glory manifested and revealed through His creation, man. When the glory moves from Adam and Eve, then God chooses a nation. The nation of Israel, and through them, He would reveal His glory. And right throughout the Old Testament, you can see time and time again how God manifests His power, how God manifests His, His, His attributes and His characteristics through the people of Israel. The glory of God was upon them. In many ways, it was manifested, the fire from heaven, uh, and many other ways. And there was the Holy of Holies, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, that was representative of the glory of God. The glory of God was in the midst of His people. But Israel did exactly what Adam and Eve did. They were disobedient. Instead of listening to the commandments of God and obeying God and fulfilling God's purpose and plan for them, they begin to worship idols. And they turn to strange gods. And eventually that glory departs. The, the Ark of the Covenant is stolen and Eli's daughter has a baby. She calls the baby Ichabod. Ichabod means the glory has departed. It's a terrible thing when the glory departs. But God's plan continues to go ahead. And so Israel fails him and he brings an, one individual. And that individual is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now through that one person, once again, he's going to reveal his glory. That's why it says the very moment Jesus performed that miracle, He revealed the glory of the Father. And right throughout Jesus' life, there was a manifestation of the glory of God. In fact, when He stands in front of the tomb and He calls Lazarus, He says, Lazarus, come forth. And that man is resurrected by the very Word and the power of God. He says to those that stand around, Did I not tell you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. And so through Jesus, there's a great manifestation of the glory of God. Through His characteristics, His love, His kindness, His mercy, His goodness, all those things are revealed through the life of Jesus. But not only that, also power. He cast out demons. He healed the sick. Wherever He went, manifestation of the glory of God. Jesus paid the price on Calvary, went back to the Father, seated at the right hand side of God the Father right now. But God's plan continues to go forward. Now He's raised up a new nation. And that nation is called the Church of Jesus Christ. Men and women that have been called from all different walks of life, from all different nationalities. He's changed them and transformed them by His mighty power. Does the Bible not say if a man or a woman is in Christ, they are new creatures? All the old things pass away. You see, as long as you're an old creature, as long as you live in sin and away from God, God cannot manifest His glory through a sinful vessel. 
You have to be transformed. You have to be renewed. You have to become a brand new creature. Creature. And the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God still wants to manifest and reveal His glory through us. Now we have a tremendous responsibility. And the responsibility of the church is to declare the glory of the Lord. Look what he says here in First Chronicles. He says, declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He's also to be feared above all gods. For all gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and gladness are in his place. And so there is the commandment that we must declare the glory of the Lord. Now look what he says in the New Testament in Peter. He says, declare, declare the praises, declare the glory of him that has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are, have a responsibility to declare the glory of the Lord. The church is not about the pastor. The church is not about the worship team. The church is not about the programs. The church is about the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is His church. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We must be careful with the glory of the Lord. It belongs to Him. He died for our sins. Not the pastor, not the bishop, not the reverend. It is Jesus that died for our sins. And the Bible says He must have the preeminence. In all things, we come to church, not because of programs. We come to church because we've come to worship the living God and allow His glory to flow through us. And so we call to declare. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. It says they, they were all baptized with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other languages. The Spirit gave them utterance. And there were other people who say, what's going on here? How is it possible we hear these people praising God in our own language? Something supernatural happened at Pentecost. Those men were ordinary fishermen and carpenters, but they've been transformed by the power of God. They became new, new creatures, and now they're filled with God's Spirit, and immediately they give God the glory. Doesn't the Bible say, from your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water? That's our responsibility. We declare, we make known, we state clearly, we proclaim, we reveal the glory of the Lord. As a congregation, as a church, but also as individuals. And God is very meticulous about His glory. He said, I will have no man rob me of my glory. And I'm going to give you an example because someone did. In Acts chapter 12, we read about Herod. It says, when the day arrived, Herod put on his royal robes. He was a king. He sat on his throne and he made a great speech. And the people gave him a great ovation, shouting, it is the voice of God and not the voice of man. I, I mean, just because he gave a great speech, people are swept off their feet and they begin to worship this man. Because he accepted the people's worship, instead of reflecting the glory to God, the Bible says an angel came and struck him down dead. The worms ate him up. But the next verse says the word of God grew and multiplied. You see, it's a serious matter. It's a serious matter for any of us to look for glory. The glory belongs to him. The glory belongs to him. The praises belongs to Him. It is He who has died for us. We see all St. Peter and, uh, and John going up to the temple to pray just after that great day when they were in, uh, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Uh, they going to the temple to pray. And when they get there to the temple, there's a man sitting at Gate Beautiful. That's what the name of the gate was, but it wasn't beautiful for this man because he'd been lame from his mother's womb. 
And he'd been sitting there for all these years, over 40 years. People take him there, he sits there, and he asks for uh, help. And th that was a good place for him to sit because he probably expected that religious people will be gracious and kind and will give him money. But isn't it sad when you think about it? Here is, here is the, the church. And, and, and they're going through all their religious rituals. But they're not doing what Jesus did. They're going through all that religious and they feel so spiritual and so religious. But outside the gate is a man sitting and no one does anything about it. But on this day, two ordinary men who were filled with the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. They look at this man and they say to him, silver and gold we don't have. The church really can't say that today. We have plenty of silver and gold. But he says, such as I have, we give unto you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And they pulled him up and he stood on his ankles and he was instantaneously healed. It was a manifestation of the glory of the Lord. He runs into the temple and in that temple, he begins to praise and worship God. Can you imagine those religious people still going through all their paraphernalia, going through all their uh, uh, traditions? Suddenly the man who is sitting outside is healed and made whole. And then something else happens. The people begin to look at them and worship them. And, and Peter has to go, he says, it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Of all our ancestors, it is that God that brought glory to his son Jesus. He said, this man is healed because the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has brought glory to his son, Jesus. It is in the name of Jesus that this man has been made whole. Isn't it amazing? The moment something miraculous happens, they begin to worship the man. But these men understood the glory of God. Immediately they say, no, it's not us. It's not by our own strength and by our own wisdom that this man has been made whole. It's in the name of Jesus that he has been made whole. What happens? They declare the glory of the Lord. That's what we have to do. It's not us. It doesn't matter how great you are, it's not you. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. In Acts chapter 14, verse 8, they say there was a crippled man. And, and uh, Paul looks at him and he perceives that this man has faith to be healed. Now, how did he perceive it? From one of the gifts of the Spirit, a word of knowledge. And he says to this man, stand up. And you know, Jesus often did that. Jesus didn't always lay hands on the sick and pray for an hour. Many times he just commanded, said, be healed. Stand up, walk, blind eyes be open, and it happened. Manifesting the glory of God. And so the, the, this man jumps and he starts jumping around. He's healed. You know what the people say? They say, these men are gods in human bodies. And even the priests who were representative of the true God brought sacrifices to offer up to these men. You see how easily people can be deceived. How easily we can be distracted. How easily we can steal the glory of God and give it to a man. And they go and they tear their clothes, Paul and Barnabas. As they saw what happened, they tear their clothes and they say, and they ran, them, ran among the people and they said, Friends, what are you doing? We are just as human as you are. And they declare God's glory. They say, God has not left himself without a witness. They were witnesses. They declared the glory of the Lord. And that's what God wants you and I to do. To declare his glory. That's the responsibility of the church. In our unsaved state, we cannot do it because God will not reveal His glory through us. But when we're born again, we become new creatures. 
And then God begins to reveal His glory. In fact, the New Testament speaks a lot about it. In fact, he says this. He says, we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image by one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. When you get born again, it's only the beginning. Then the transformation takes place. One degree of glory to another. Why? Because God's purpose is to transform us into the image of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going somewhere when we get born again. So even if you're born yesterday, God still enables you or He still reveals His glory through you. What am I saying? I'm saying our testimony, our witness is vital. It is important. Folk, we cannot come to church on a Sunday or any other day and worship God and clap our hands and say amen to the word, but the rest of the week we live far from God. We drink and we swear and we curse, all those kind of things. It doesn't bring glory to Him. What brings glory to Him is when you and I manifest His characteristics and Galatians the fruit of the Spirit is the character of Jesus. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, temperance. I know I fail so many times, but I understand why God has created me. And I continuously ask God to help me that His glory might be revealed through me. I'm nothing. But He has chosen to reveal His glory through earthen vessels, you and I. I come from a bad past, but he changed me. And now he says, from my innermost being can flow rivers of living water. So wherever I go, what flows out of me, what should flow out of me, as I declare the glory of the Lord is living water. Living water brings hope. Living water brings life. Living water brings change. And God expects that from each and every one of us. It's not a matter of fact, just get saved and go to church and sing the songs and that's it. That's no, that's not, that's just part of it. We have to declare His glory. And in a day in which you and I are living, it's very challenging because most people don't want to hear about him in our workplace. Wherever you go, people ridicule and they don't have much time for Christians. And, and it's going to get worse, by the way. And that's why it's a great opportunity for you and I to do what God has created us to do. Manifest his glory. It says, to whom God would make known what is the riches of of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in me, the hope of glory. I'm challenging you tonight. I'm challenging you to live a different life, to, to ask God to help you every single day to let His glory be manifested through you. That people might see Christ in you, the hope of glory. Will you stand as I pray? Thank you. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you that you continuously challenge us because your plan is to change us so that your glory can be revealed through our lives. We thank you for every person here tonight, those that have already committed their lives to you, we thank you for them. We thank you for this great miracle that you have already performed in their lives. Now, Lord, we pray for all of us that you will help us, that we might be vessels of honor so that your glory can be manifested and revealed through us, not only on Sundays, but every single day of our lives. I pray that you'll give us power, that we will not be ashamed of the gospel. Give us power, Lord, to lay hands on the sick and believe that you can raise them up and make them whole. Give us power, Lord, that we can come to those that are in bondage knowing with the, that you can destroy the works of the devil and set them free. 
We remind ourselves, Jesus, that you said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, open the blind eyes, heal the broken heart, and to set the captives free. Lord, we pray tonight that you will use us and that your glory will be revealed through us that we might bring hope to those that are hopeless at this moment. We ask that in Jesus' name.